We're rolling. Welcome to the House Dudes Podcast, where we invite you to follow us on our journey towards financial freedom using the power of real estate. I'm Jack Haas. And I'm Josh Koth. Here at House Dudes, we believe in a couple key principles. Number one, the best way to retain information is by teaching it to others. And number two, a rising tide lifts all boats. We're not competitors, we're a community. So let's get into some real estate investing. Well, we have Michael Green on the line and Michael has a ton of experience uh, with flipping houses, um, but Michael, I'm going to just throw it over to you right off the bat. Can you introduce yourself and and we'll get the conversation going because I know I have a ton of questions for you. Well, quick introduction. My name is Michael Green. Obviously, I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. I've been flipping houses about 11 years. Uh, to date, I've got over a thousand houses flipped. Uh, I've for many many years was really big into volume, and over the last couple years, I've been taking a very different approach. And I, and I believe it's through wisdom is I've been scaling down the profit up. I'm really big now on, you know, quality over quantity and really focusing on making more and doing less flips. Uh, I think the, the growth thing for a long time was really just kind of an ego thing. So now uh, I'm realizing the ability to do 10 houses a year and make 40 K and just bring in 300 plus thousand dollars and, you know, and have quality of life that matches with it, which is really important. For many years when I was scaling and doing crazy stuff, I totally did not have quality of life. I just had an insane business that I really enjoyed running, but uh, no travel vacations, none of the awesome reasons we get into real estate. So sure. that's me in a nutshell. I'm kind of like an insane, uh, I love house flipping. I stay very focused, even though I love rentals, I love everything else. I have to kind of shut those things off because I, I believe in the one thing, uh, Gary Keller, I love the book. I've read it about mm -hmm. five times and, uh, and I still read it every six months because uh, I do have a little ADD and like everyone, I love to do a lot of different things, but I found my success has been in picking one thing and just really mastering it. And yeah. 11 years in, I still have so much to learn. Sure. Well, you know, like I told you before, when we started this this call, uh, a lot of our listeners are relatively new to real estate investing and and many of them are, you know, they typically start in wholesaling or they're trying to make that that uh, extra money for the down payment on their on their next rental through flipping. What are some of those uh early lessons that somebody should be aware of when going into to flipping? Flipping like anything, there's really two, really three main factors, but two of them most people focus on. So everyone talks about finding deals. That's the thing that really got me into it. It's the first thing I learned. And you definitely need a good way to find deals. You need to be able to talk to sellers. You got to have a good routine for that, that is successful analyzing those deals correctly. But the second piece that very few people talk about, and I don't think is very sexy, but is really where most of the money gets lost in a flip is dealing with contractors and being able to get the work done efficiently and fast. And, uh, and this has been for me, my business took a, a complete 360 when I started learning to get work done cheaper, more efficiently, and really gain control of that. Because there's many years where I had the limiting belief, well, contractors just don't, you know, they are who they are, essentially. I was making mm -hmm. excuses for them. And once I, re I got a coach who kind of challenged me on that and said, Mike, well, what if they weren't like that? And what would it take? And uh, so I spent about four years now, I've been just figuring out like, okay, what would it be like to have contractors actually do what they say? Day. Uh, come in and work mm -hmm. for very affordable prices, get done faster than most others and not cry and complain all the time and not drive me crazy. I realized it was actually about 80% of my headaches and house flipping had more to do with the contractors than it was finding deals. Finding deals, once you get good at it and you have a good system for it, it's fairly easy, honestly. It's something that, you know, you just have, you do have to study and learn. You're not just going to go do it right off the bat. But if you're going to the right people, the right sellers, you're building relationships, you're, you're doing some of the core things that are really important, you'll find that you will have, you know, a steady flow of deals, especially if you don't need 100 of them a year and you're just looking to do five or 10 houses a year. But the contractor piece, it, it took me about two to three years of really figuring out how to gain abundance around that. And once I did, then the third part where a lot of money is made is on the back end and selling. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of mistakes I made over the, you know, the history of being in this business where um, I'd list it for say 200 and get 200 and be really excited. And uh, what I've learned in my, you know, I could say, I'd like to say in my wisdom, right? I'm still very new at this, even at 10 years, but um, I've learned that there's a lot of uh, opportunity on the back end to sell these houses for considerably more than what you actually believed in the first place. They're creating a, a very competitive, almost auction type environment. Uh, we literally just put a house on the market two days ago and right now at 36 showings, uh, nine offers. And right now we're 15K over list price, uh, close to a $300,000 price point in the middle of a, we've been on a shutdown for seven days. So 
we do have. But luckily for us, they did consider construction and realtors to be essential. So people can still show home. So we're not on a complete lockdown, but we are on a semi lockdown. So, you know, most sure. of our, the roads are pretty clear right now. So we're very fortunate that's happening. But um, the thing about this is, is there's a lot of room to be made there. And you start compounding. Like, you know, I love that you talk a lot about having like an automated way to get deals. It's something that I've listened to a few podcasts. I really love, you know, it's a very important piece. There's a little bit of money going to be made there. There's a little bit of money going to be made with the contractors and there's a little bit of money can be made on the back end when selling. And if you compound all that together, it's a lot of money, right? Mm -hmm. It's a difference in making 25 K a flip and making 40 K a flip and now being able to do seven to 10 houses a year instead of 20 when you ramp up and be able to make the same income, which means, you know, it's a very uh, simple business concept. You know, the less overhead you have and the less work you have to put in to make money, profit margins are always going to be higher. So that's been my focus for a while. And uh, a lot of people think I'm the scale guy, but I'm actually went from doing 150 houses a year and I'm looking to do 30 in this next, you know, 2020. Right. You know, it's, it's interesting that you, you we're backtrack there for a second. It's interesting. You talk about uh, picking out your contractors and we, we're starting to realize that it's much like uh, finding a good property manager. When you have rentals, a good property manager could really make or break a property and the cash flow associated with it. I am definitely discovering that with contractors and general contractors and everything else. How do you, what is your process on, on selecting or finding those team members? I'm going to call them team members because in, in the end, uh, you really have to have a good working relationship with them. Uh, I totally agree with that. Right now, one of my big focuses with everything going on out there is um, how to maintain a balanced, you know, flipping business without shutting it completely down. And the main reason behind that, I mean, totally, I'm in a place where I could just shut it down for a couple months and see what happens. But I've got team members out there that I need to consider that really do what they say. And it's very difficult to get that together. So some of my thought process is how do I keep them feeding their families Mm -hmm. without me taking a huge amount of risk, finding that striking that balance between the two. So I'm not one of the few people that will be shutting down right now. I'm just trying to find a nice safe balance between the two. So, you know, I'm not completely burning these bridges. So I believe in that. The question you asked was, how do I find those guys? So first big change that I realized I had to make is when I really first started this and I was very new, because I didn't know everything about construction, my way of figuring out what something should cost or estimating a repair was getting multiple contractors out, getting three estimates, picking the middle one, or, you know, don't take the lowest or highest. The stuff we've all been taught, you know, like over the years. And, uh, and I realized, and I learned this from Home Depot and Lowe's is I realized like big commercial companies, they don't really do it that way. And I really start taking some notes from how they run. Like if you were to work with like a, you know, multi-billion dollar commercial company, they create standardized pricing and they don't get estimates. They actually create the pricing for the unit of work that's being done. They understand the standard amount of time it should take. They understand the standard amount of money that should be paid for that. And, uh, and that's it. So that, you know, we really took this big shift from asking contractors what something cost to telling them what we'll pay. And that for me was like the biggest shift that you can make. And this is really applicable for landlords, flippers, whatever it might be, because, you know, you're obviously going to get your best rentals if they need some repairs because I have a lot of baked in equity that, you know, you'll be able to get a better ROI on the back end, you know, versus buying a turnkey. So, you know, you're always going to be able to, if you can get the construction done well, then that becomes an opportunity to make your rentals grow even faster and make more money on your flip so you can get more rentals. So this is really awesome all the way around. But so we start off with standardized pricing. Once we have standardized pricing, then uh, it becomes all about filtering, right? If you, you put an ad out for a contractor, you're going to get 20 responses. And of those 20 responses, just like if we were doing a mailing to motivated sellers, mm-hmm. 18 or 19 of them aren't going to be a good fit. So I create a funnel that where like where I do Craigslist ads, but then I run them through an application process and I run them through a filtering system that literally weeds out the 18 that aren't going to follow or, you know, really going to be a good fit for my standardized pricing. Now I'm only talking to two or three people who are kind of on board before I ever get on the phone with them. And then on the phone, I'm actually filtering also. So, because I think most of your time's wasted when you go meet people at the property. Um, I won't meet anyone until they basically verbally agreed on the phone that we're all on the same page. And uh, when they do, like, let's say I get five guys out, two or three of them will get out there and be like, well, now I've seen it. It's all different. You know, you know, and now it's double, you know, they got to go from, but you know, we know that if five, like two or three of them will be on the same page. And often we start to have abundance of people who understand how we do business because for years it was always me asking the contractor how to do business. And now it's me saying, okay, here's how I do business. And if that's a good fit, 
then we're good to go. And I did truly learn that from like Home Depot and Lowe's. Like if a sub- subcontractor works for Home Depot, they don't give Home Depot estimates. Home Depot basically says like, hey man, here's our price sheet. Here's what we pay, right? And this is it. And we just, you know, take it or leave it kind of thing. And, uh, and you can do that even when you're new. So there's probably some people listening saying, well, of course, Mike, you can do that. You've been in the game a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, you can do it if it's your first house, as long as you understand it. And you really take that uh, emotional approach to it, right? That has to be your mindset around like how you're going to do business. Because the problem is when you give them control, um, contractors, as much as they are team members, they, they have a very uh, big conflict of interest, right? I mean, the way they make money is by giving us change orders, by charging us more than they should. They don't really have any reason to be fast and efficient if we pay them too much. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the pricing that's going to be sharp actually qualifies out slow people and gets to the people who are very efficient, who think more like a subcontractor, like I'm going to install 500 square foot of floor and I'm going to get paid a dollar fifty a foot. So for me to make money, I have to do that two days with one other person. Mm-hmm. And we can get people thinking that way. They tend to be a lot faster. It, it becomes easier for us because we're all on the same page. Sure. So it's easy for me to say, hey, hey, Matt, uh, you know, you didn't, you didn't do a great job or Jack, right? And you didn't do a great job. So uh, bottom line, you know what? Um, this is where you need to be. So it's just really mm-hmm. simple, right? Real simple stuff. Yeah. And as you get into this routine, I'm going to guess that you're pretty much working with the same contractors over and over again. They know that it becomes about a lot more predictable. It becomes really predictable because there's so much insanity around working with contractors and there's so many games that they like to play and manipulations they like to pull. This is something you're going to run into when you deal with contractors, period. It's so entrenched in the contractor's beliefs and mindset that if you don't have a system like this, it's nearly impossible to have a good experience with uh, with contractors in general. You almost have to get extremely lucky for that to happen. So yes, once they understand it, what I found is if you take a lot of energy and time to weed down to what we like to call like a five-star contractor or an A-plus contractor, the really good guy fits perfectly into our system. What we found is you'll put a lot of energy into hiring that one person, but once you get them, they do stay around. Most of my guys have been with me five or six years now. And what's even better, you know, eight rock stars, no rock stars. So often they'll say, oh, no, that guy sucks, but I got this other guy who's a great electrician. I'll refer him to you. And we find that like a lot of the work is front loaded. And then next thing you know, it kind of like we don't have to do much anymore on advertising because if we ever need someone and someone falls out of our system, we basically can go to all the rock stars we currently have and they generally will be able to refer someone to us. So it's, you know, it started as a lot of work a couple of years ago when we were changing this all around, but now it's gotten down to being a very, uh, very uh, congruent ecosystem where we just keep pulling from the, from the ecosystem and keeping everything very balanced. Sure. When you're going through this process of trying to find these uh, contractors, I'm going to guess that you've had experience where you've decided or realized pretty early that you, you might have the wrong contractor on the job. What are some of those red flags and how did you approach those contractors and just to break the ties? So probably one of the big things, right, is we have to start off on the right foot. We have to have a system that's going to help us, like a control, right? When you think of Mm -hmm. bookkeeping or anything, you need controls, things that are going to be like, okay, it's good, but it's a green light or red light right now. So for us, how we do that is I've moved away from hiring GCs and giving them all the work because it's really complex to know if, you know, where they are as far as milestones. It's very difficult to break down. You end up investing in a crazy amount of energy into people before you know if they're even any good. So what we do instead is we line item everything out. And when someone new comes in, they get a small line item and they essentially get an on the job interview is what we call it. So it might be like, Hey, do this thousand dollar job that takes a day or two. And uh, they knock that out. They do a good job. They move on. They get, they get a second job, a third job. Then we'll start giving them two or three jobs at a time. Uh, Once they've done a flip or two and they really have proven to be a good quality person, then we might go where like, Hey, you get all, you know, you get 80% of the line items that you're qualified to do. And uh, they get a little more freedom there, but we don't, we don't give them trust until they've earned it. That was my big mistake in the past is, you know, somebody would have, the title general contractor or contractor and I would just assume trust to them and uh, they had not earned it and I realized that was a mistake probably in life in many areas we we tend to trust people beyond what we should Mm -hmm. how do you without a general contractor then how do you manage the workflow you know when the flooring guy goes in when the you know how do you how do you manage that you know typically a general contractor handle that's a big part of their job yeah it is so what we do 
and this is what we initially do. And I, when someone's really new for me, what I find to be the best way is for them to be their own GC. But when I say that, I want to be clear that you're not going to manage every little piece of it. But the things I believe that you should be and know exactly how to do, you should be able to walk in a house and know what things should cost. You should be able to walk in a house and determine what the design's going to be that's going to make it sell for the most. You know, the, you know, the layout of it. And also what designs are going to take for you to compete. The price, right? You want to be the architect of everything that's going to be happening and not the GC. So for many years, I would lean on GCs to tell me those important pieces of my business. And uh, it made me very unpredictable. So like some houses would sell, some wouldn't because I was just not, I found that I'm better suited to make those choices on each house. So there's a little bit of work that I do on every house. When I buy it, I'm the one doing the line items. I'm the one going in and deciding how to lay it out. And uh, so at some level, I become the GC. Now what is very easily given out and what I like to call my GCs are more like assistant GCs because I feel like I'm truly the GC, but, but I am giving them a lot of the work. So once I get someone I trust and like, and they, they're, you know, very reliable, then I'll mm -hmm. start delegating work off to them, like, you know, calling or making sure people have come and done the work. And so I do actually keep my thumb on the pulse of what's going on because I don't think there's any other way to truly have control over contractors. And one of the biggest areas of money that's, you know, kind of flowing in and out in a flip is going to be in your construction. So it makes sense for me when you're newer, especially to have a really good, you know, good understanding of where the money's going, how it's being spent. You got to really keep your eye on it. We're even going like insanely crazy now where I'm changing everything in my books to looking like every little detail of job costing so that I can tighten that up even more because, you know, across doing like 10 flips at a time, there's probably a tremendous amount. I'm already, well, I'm not going to tell you there's probably, I've already found out just in the last month or two, there's a lot of money that I could be saving over a year uh, just by getting that much, even more involved. So I don't really believe in the whole turnkey, just, hey, here you go, contractor. Get, here's 30K. Let me know when you're done. Personally, I haven't found a lot of people that have made that highly successful. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, and maybe for rentals, it works a little better if you're doing like 10 or 15K. But if you are doing a full scale renovation, then know that there's a lot of money going in and out and that you really want to have an understanding of what's going on because when you don't, it opens the door for contractors to kind of, you know, just tell you stuff. And, uh, right. then, and then you really are at risk of maybe spending an extra 10 or 20 K and the, the compounding effect of that that no one talks about. If you like, let's just say you do a house and it's uh, you cost you 70 K, but it cost me 60. Your offer is going to generally be 10 K lower and in a very competitive environment, which we're actually still seeing even with everything going on. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you're going to lose and it's going to be harder for you to get deals. And then what you're going to do is another, you know, subsequent, you know, thing you're going to try to do, you're going to say, Oh, well we have to do more marketing or more expensive stuff stuff. And so I'm actually like last year did over 20 some deals off the MLS because I am competitive enough by cutting my costs down on my renovations and listing my own properties as a realtor and cutting that cost. I'm able to go in and actually buy right off the MLS and average 39 K a deal uh, price points around like 225 to 275, uh, which personally I would do all day long. And I'm averaging about 60 K on my renovations just to give you a feel of kind of like, it's going to be a little different for every market. Obviously some markets, 20 or 30 K is a standard. We're about 60 to 65 K here in Maryland because houses are a little bit older. Sure. So, um, could we talk a little bit about like some of those things that you've found then as you're tightening, uh, tightening up your, uh, and getting more control over the flipping, like what were some of those um, multipliers or uh, savings that you found that really made a big difference? You, you mentioned that you started off making like 20,000 a flip and now it's closing in on closer to 40,000. That's, that's a hundred percent increase. Like what, what were some of those line items that you discovered were the big hitters? And I'm, I'm sure you had discovered a, a few of them there. Yeah, there's, a, there's some that uh, people aren't getting rich on and there's others that they are. So I'll give you a great example of something me and a lot of my students are doing right now. Uh, for years, I would pay five to six K to waterproof a basement that maybe is like a hundred linear foot on average, you know, uh, and that was about five or six K I would pay for that. And I gladly paid that. We're finding right now that we can actually buy the materials and hire someone for 2K to do the labor. The materials are running about 1,200, so now I'm getting that done for 3,200, saving myself just a couple grand on that one line item. Now, you really think about how like you can do that across the board. Now, where we're not finding we're able to save big chunks of money is electric, plumbing, and HVAC, but we were already doing that very affordably. So for me, like if I was to go in a house and put ducts in an HVAC unit, it cost me about 6,000 to 6,500, which, which we're finding is about as cheap as you can get it done. Mm -hmm. A lot of other investors are paying about 8,000 for that. So when you start thinking, okay, there's 1,500 bucks there, there's another two grand on the waterproofing. You know, it's just not overpaying. It's so easy to get 
a belief. If you go and talk to five electricians, they're going to all tell you eight to 10. Some are going to tell you 15 K even. And when they start telling you those numbers, eight K sounds cheap. So it is about you understanding what the actual most affordable price someone can do it for. So personally, we love to break down like the reason we understand that HVAC can be done for say 6,500 is the materials run around 3,000 to 3,500. And it takes them three days to rough it in and get ducks in and all that. And it's about a thousand bucks a day roughly. So we look at it sure. like, okay, two guys, thousand dollars a day. That's very good pay. But mm -hmm. does that mean that every HVAC guy is going to understand that? No, you're going to have to do the funnel and you're going to have to go through 18 people, weed them out and get to the two people who understand how to work with house flippers. And if you're able to do that across the board, then you're going to really save a lot of money. Cause I mean, look, I pay two grand to paint a house labor. And, uh, and that's going to be a house that's about 13 to 1500 square foot, usually has a basement. Uh, you know, I know people pay 2,700 to do that. 700 bucks. Again, these don't sound like big numbers, but when you start to multiply them, it's the difference. And again, me doing something for 60 and someone else who's not tightening, tightening those numbers down, doing it for 70 or 75, which gives me like a 15 K advantage just on the construction. Then obviously I've, I've listened to a lot of your podcasts and I've seen a lot of what you talk about and you know, it's a lot about like, you know, getting good deals. Well, you know, if you can get a deal for 5k cheaper, that's going to really tighten things up and multiply for you. Doesn't again, doesn't sound like a lot, but it is a multiplier for sure. So 5k there, 10k on the construction. And then on the back end, if you create a really strong environment where you're literally just getting another five or 10k, that's how I start went from 20k to 40k. It took me about three years of tightening all these things up, but um, you know, and everything's been really good. And, and I did it in a time where everyone else's profits were going down. Mine were actually going up because we all think that we're held to what's what is but the reality is there's a lot of room to make shifts and changes in the house flipping especially around construction buying you know you get just a little bit better at talking to sellers like I'll, mm -hmm. another big shift we made is we used to be 15 20 minutes with motivated sellers uh, I now book two hours to sit with them and if they'll talk to me for two hours I will literally sit with them for two hours because leads are expensive to generate right now mm -hmm. and, uh, and we have to respect them at a much higher level. So I now realize the only advantage I really have over everyone else is my willingness to sit there and talk about their grandchildren, the house, you know, anything to where now they're creating this emotional connection and they want to work with me. So, you know, at mm -hmm. some level, if someone else comes in and offers 10K more, I at least get a phone call saying, Mike, uh, I really want to work with you. Could you at least match this? And many times we find that we don't even need to match it to get the deal. We can be like, hey, we can get within a couple grand. And they're just so, they trust us so much that they would want to work with us. And then obviously when you build trust like that, you know, it goes without saying that you actually have to honor that trust and, and do what you say because it's a pretty big thing in life. And I think it's just a good character piece for anything you do in life. But um, so there's a really big way that you can start winning more deals for me. And that's what's been working for me. You know, I went from a half hour because you know, five years ago we had a lot of leads. So it was all about how to manage all those leads. And now we have less leads and it's all about how to close uh, the same amount of deals with less leads. Sure. You know, with, with the whole coronavirus and everything that's going on right now, how has that changed uh, finding those deals? What, what are, are you doing anything different? And, and, and has well, it so, slowed right, down it, your renovations at all? I mean, I'm just going to pile on on that one. Uh, I mean, two great questions. Right now, we're not seeing any change. So I'll tell you what we have seen and, uh, and I'll give you an explanation why, because it didn't make a lot of sense. We've actually seen an uptick in showings and offers, and uh, which made my brain not work because I'm like, you know, I'm very logical. I'm very big right. analyzer. And I'm like, that doesn't make sense. Why would that be the case? Like we're going through something pretty big right now. Why would there be an uptick? What we found out locally is we already had an inventory crisis in the Maryland, D.C. area. And most of the country has had somewhat of an inventory crisis. Well, inventory inventory has shot down and we've lost inventory because if you look at a hundred houses on the market, 95 mm -hmm. of those houses are homeowners selling their home, right? Mm -hmm. Five of them are flips, you know, vacant flips. Now what's happening with, we're seeing at a pretty high rate is that homeowners are taking their houses off the market right now because they're stuck in home and they don't want people running through their house all day long and, you know, spreading right. disease. It's just, it's inconvenient. Maybe it's not the disease. Maybe they just don't, you know, cause they're home now and they're not working. So we're seeing a lot of people take their listings off the market temporarily, meaning that uh, we still got a lot of buyers out there, people that are essential that actually are have even more job security and what's going on right now. And uh, those people are 
rampantly trying to buy and that there's even less inventory today than there was three weeks ago because uh, how many houses have come off the market. So like I said, we just put, you know, we've sold four houses in the last 10 days and all of those went for multiple offers. Like I think probably got six on one and everything was beyond six and tremendous amounts of showings and stuff. So that's still going pretty well. So I feel like the selling piece is going well. The construction has not been held up yet. Um, one of my concerns for the future would be supply, you know, will we be able to get everything we need? So I'm already kind of thinking in advance, well, you know, what could, could like, tighten up. We get, obviously get, we work with a guy who does cabinets and I believe he gets those from China. I can't mm -hmm. imagine that's not going to be interrupted. So we're trying to make sure right. we're a little ahead of the game in getting materials. You know, we're not waiting to the most time when you're busy, you wait the last minute. So we're trying to get everything like a week or two in advance just to make sure that, you know, we do it, the material be there when it's time, or at least we'll have some room if it takes an extra week or two to get it. Cause that definitely could be a very real thing in the future. Um, I don't think it's to the point where it's going to shut the industry down. Again, a lot of these things are just going to be about maneuvering and doing things a little differently a little bit better right so what what have you done differently when you're talking to motivated sellers then so motivated sellers right now i would say that the the change has been more in me right when three weeks ago we were in a highly competitive market and i would say I was very competitive in trying to win deals. So sometimes we stretch a little bit when we want to win. I might even go as far as saying I was a motivated buyer because you know it was hard to get deals. Uh, I am not a motivated buyer right now. So I think one of the natural changes is going to happen is I'm going to start talking to sellers a little more qualifying. You know, I'm going to be like, hey, I don't need the deal right now. We got a lot going on. So anytime you take that position in any market, you're going to get a better deal. It's all about like most of the stuff happens with us versus with them. If we're talking to someone like we don't need them, they tend to come towards us mm -hmm. versus when they're like, yeah, man, we really could do this for you. Let's make this happen. They tend to move away from us. So I try to get myself in that mindset when things are really good, but it's not always easy. Right. I think it's very easy right now, right? I think we're all coming from a place of like, we don't really need a house right now unless the deal makes sense. So when I'm talking to motivated sellers, I am looking for you know a little bit of a discount. I think I'm naturally going to get it because I'm not desperate to buy a deal right now. And uh, I don't have any fear that in 30 days, there won't be plenty of opportunity. And knowing that has put me in a very abundant mindset uh, where I'm buying stuff, but I'm not buying it insanely cheap because in 2008, we only seen like a percent a month where we were is what we've seen. So and I'm usually in and out four to six months. So we would have a calculator that in eight when we were flipping, uh, we literally would just take like 6% off of whatever the ARV was at that point. And it worked out really well. We were able to sell uh, a plenty of houses, really grow our business in 2008, nine and 10, when everyone else was kind of falling apart. We had no issue doing that because of the fact we were buying with like a slight discount. So I'm doing something very similar to that now. I don't know that it's going to go down 6% in the next six months, but I do know that if I'm talking to a motivated seller, they totally have the belief that it might. So mm -hmm. that's not me, not me sounding like a goofball when I say that. I, right. I think most people are going to buy into that. And, uh, and I like that I'll be buying based on something that could happen. And then I feel like I'm protected if it does happen. But if it doesn't happen and maybe the market, you know, tightens up faster than we thought, because uh, it has not dropped at all. It's actually been going up right this, as we speak. So we haven't seen any data to suggest that, at least here in Maryland. So no, anything I'm talking about, I am talking about my niche here in Maryland. That might be mm -hmm. very different in California, any other state. So definitely take this advice and just run it through the filter where you are, what, can, what situation you're in. But here in Maryland, it has not went down. So I think we have like the opportunity to create this arbitrage right now. Of, you know, essentially, you know, we can buy cheaper and potentially on the back end, we won't even be selling cheaper. So we can make even more money right now. And if it does go down, we'll be in about the same position. Mm -hmm. You're talking about the, the selling. I, I'd like to spend a little time on that because uh, you have a different way of handling that too. Earlier, you mentioned basically being in more of an auction situation and, and more of a competitive uh, when, it, when it comes to uh, fielding those deals. Can you talk to how how you've positioned your marketing and and when it comes to the selling side uh to achieve that so for a long time i try to get my realtor to do this i don't i didn't become a realtor because i was greedy and trying to save commissions i became a realtor because i couldn't get my realtor to really run the optimal environment for whatever reason they have so much junk that's been you know cooked into their brains by their brokers and everyone else mm -hmm. that they 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 like to use the term everything well that's illegal or it's not right or it's not ethical like 
I feel like in my opinion, and I've been backed up by many people at this, is that getting the most money for your client, whether that's you or someone else, is always your number one objective. As long as you're doing it honestly and ethically, and we totally right. do that. But uh, you know, they just don't, you know, they, they're very used to their normal way. So what we do is there's a couple steps to really getting a house to sell and get very insane on the back end. Obviously, on the front side, we're picking the right homes, right? There's going to be homes that have a bigger buyer pool than other homes. So for us here in Maryland, the perfect home that seems to have a really large buyer pool would be the first time home buyer house, uh, somewhere between a thousand to 1500 square feet. Finished basements are really big and price point around like 200 to 300 K. So we know that if we have that house with a decent yard and a good area that's local to the beltway and, you know, can get to DC Baltimore very easily, that home really, there's no economy that home doesn't sell in, right? Mm -hmm. It's just going to sell in every economy. It's a very recession proof house. Uh, the houses that we stay away from are going to be, you know, luxury homes, vacation homes, things like that, because they do go up and down with the economy quite a bit. So first of all, we're picking the right house, the house that has like 80% buyer's pool, because there's other houses might have 10%. There's someone you can sell it to, but you really want to have the lion's share of the buyer's pool, knowing that there's so many of the people that need these homes, you'll never have to worry about good economy, bad economy, whatever it is. So we focus on that first. Secondarily, the next thing we really focus on to make it really insane on the back end for the sale is making sure we have like that perfect layout. I think the, for me, what's worked really well is when you walk in a home, if it's got that great, what we call great room look, you know, you walk in, you can see from front to back, it's living room, dining room, kitchen, it's all together. There's an island in the house. It's a, mm -hmm. a gourmet kitchen. You know, it just looks really nice. And then obviously it has a master suite. If we can squeeze that into the very small square footage, we're doing really good. So most of our house Houses will, you know, kind of the tail of the tape is most of them are like four threes. They generally be three, two above grade, one, one in the basement, uh, master suite, meaning at least 12 by 15 with a nice closet, nice bathroom. And then the great room on the first floor, finished basement, that house, if we can squeeze that into a thousand to 1500 square feet, uh, it just, there's no one who doesn't want that, right? No, even mm -hmm. if someone is just a, a couple, they're excited to have four, three, because they feel like in the future we could use these rooms or do whatever. Maybe they want to Airbnb right. some stuff to make some extra money uh, or just whatever, right? They feel like they have options and they don't have any problem reselling it later. So we always go for layout as being the second big thing on the backside uh, and then also layout and design. So we are doing a lot of little design things. So I'll kind of walk you through that because I think that's really valuable for the beginners. Um, um, when I was new to this, you know, everything was like tan, you know, white cabinets, brown cabinets, tan walls, you know, just real simple, no staging. Uh, now we're going a little bit like, you know, the gray, a little more modern, nice granites, you know, a little bit nicer without spending too much money. But mm -hmm. we are making sure that the house has some what we call like accent features. Uh, so we might put up one wall where we, you know, do some trim around it, paint it a different color. You know, those kind of things go a long ways. And most of the time they cost a couple hundred bucks. So they're very, they're very minuscule as far as the cost of it. But it, mm -hmm. it looks like you've put a lot of attention into your flip, which I think creates an emotional buyer because like right now I went from flipping houses logically saying, okay, logically this is a good deal and this will fit right into the market to adding mm -hmm. maybe a couple thousand bucks in upgrades that will make people see it and pick with their heart. Because if I can get someone out of their head and get them thinking with their heart, that's a much greater offer price. Like that's my, always my mission is to get five to seven offers and then find the person in the five to seven offers who's like completely heart-based and saying like, I have to have this. This is my home. That doesn't happen when you put like what I call like a C plus property that's just nice, but not like over the top nice. Now I want to be very clear that over the top nice does not mean like going out and buying like Italian granite that costs, you know, $2,000 a foot. This is all about buying the things that look expensive. It's about putting, you know, finding ways to make your house look amazing on, on the cheap, right? Like design on a dime. I used to love that show. They like come in and make something look awesome for 500 bucks. So it does require a lot of that, but it's just putting some time and energy into making your house be like one step better than your competition without spending a bunch of money. But it looks like you overspent. So when you do that and you get, and then the last piece of it that pulls it all together is if things are selling for 299, we're generally going to put it on for like 289. So we have a better laid out house, better design house. It's sharp priced, right? Really sharply priced. Uh, it essentially guarantees guarantees that almost every single house I put on will literally in, within a few days have offers and within like three to five days we'll have multiple offers. And when we get in that multiple offer situation, that's the environment that I can work magic. If I'm on the market 30 days and I get one offer, I don't care how good you are, how good of a negotiator, you can use mm -hmm. every technique in the world, but you're coming from a place of scarcity versus abundance. So like none of those things work when you're coming from scarcity. So for me, I have to get in abundance to be the best version of myself. That usually happens at least with having a couple offers. So if I got a couple offers, then I'm not so worried that if I push hard on offer one, I know I got offer three to back that up. So I'm not in a place where I'm so worried about maybe running the person off. And when I come from that place of having the freedom of 
of pushing people, I tend to get one or two people out of that mix to jump out and pay considerably more. And, uh, and I get to pick the best buyer. So like right now I'm really focusing on like, what is your job? And mm -hmm. if it's government, it's essential. I'm really, really excited about that. If it's something that I think might be a problem in the next couple of months, I'm kind of staying away from those types of people because you know, they're the type of people that could have a, a job change in the next 30 days before we get the settlement. Right. Right. Well, you know, I, I, this has been a ton of great information. And I, I, as I was trying to promise you, I'd try to keep it, you know, uh, control the time on you a little bit. I have a feeling we could have spent a lot longer, but I do understand you have a podcast of your own where if people wanted to uh, get more information and, and learn from you, uh, where would they find you and, and uh, where can they get more information? Probably the best place is to go to my website, which is the flipfactor.net. And uh, we have, you know, to go to the podcast tab, we have all the podcast on there. It's an easy way to, you know, you don't have to have a certain iTunes player or anything. If you go there, we put every podcast on and I talk about all these subjects freely, right? And I, I'm very much like you. I want to give a lot of great content. So this is valuable stuff. And we literally just uh, completed like a 15 episode contractor we call it cracking the contractor code. And we've oh, just awesome. been talking about how to deal with contractors, knowing like it's the biggest thing that I get from any of my students, any of my friends, my peers. It's like, freaking contractors drive me crazy. So if you want to learn more about that, that's the best place to find me. Also, um, you know, if you go and look up the Flip Factor podcast on iTunes, anywhere else, we're out there too. So, well, thank you so much for your time. This was awesome. And I hope we can do it again sometime. Yeah, for sure. Have a great day, man. Thank you. Thank you. We've put a lot of effort into providing useful content, and if you've found value in the show and have any interest in supporting us with a small donation, head over to patreon.com slash housedudes. And if you have any thoughts or questions, shoot us an email at info at housedudes.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at housedudes. And if you like what you're hearing, head over to iTunes, subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. It really helps other investors out there find the show. And remember... Massive positive impact requires massive positive action. We'll see you next time. This episode is brought to you by housedudes.com. Do you have time to actively manage flipping and rentals yourself? If so, go for it. If you live in a market that won't cash flow or don't have the time to do all the work, are you just out of luck? If there was a way to participate more passively, would that appeal to you? I'm sure you have questions about how the process works and what to do next. If that's the case, fill out the form on housedudes.com slash investors, and we'll reach out to see if you are a good fit for our business. This is First Come, First Serve, and we will have to stop taking applications when our goals are met. See you at housedudes.com slash investors. I don't like to tell a man what to do with his money, but if you ain't investing in property, then you're dumber than a dummy. I'm not dumb. I'm smart. Well, buy property. That's my advice.